Thank you, everyone. And I'd like to thank our two special helpers here, Clementine and Florence. These are the children of the grain. Uh, Clementine, Jason, Jason, Clark, um, Jason, Clark, from Two Wrong Farm. Uh, so three years ago, three and a half years ago, um, I'm actually really excited to have my daughter with me because three and a half years ago, I was sitting with her on my lap uh, watching Uncle Bruce's um, talk at uh, the last grain, well, the last large grains, and I was really sad to not be able to be there, um, but it was because my second child had just been born, um, Walter, so it does feel fitting to have Flo back here with me, so thanks for coming with me, Flo, thanks for coming on this trip, and thanks for helping, okay? Yeah. You guys, if you, if you guys need to come sit down, you can sit down over here, okay? All right, or you can stay there. Um, so I took the easy route definitely for this talk. Uh, when, 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 when Michael asked me to do something, I said, well, can I be in the afternoon? And maybe can I have some beer with it as well? <laughs> we'll do something um, interactive and we'll taste some beers instead of getting too technical because I feel that there's a lot of really um, scientifically knowledgeable people here. And uh, that really daunts me. And I said it in a, in a talk before that I feel like a bit of a, an imposter because I'm a practitioner um, at best. Uh, rather than a scientist. I studied physics, not necessarily microbiology. So what I know, I know from anecdotal evidence. Um, can we start pointing these ones around as well? So what I thought I'd do, um, yeah, we could pass them around. So there's going to be two, two uh, bottles, and this is the same beer. There's a third one up here. I'll come up from each side. Um, everyone looks to be over 18. I not one of those two, so we'll just watch all that out on that. Um, what I thought I'd do again in taking this is uh, thank you. Um, talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing at Wildflower, um, the brewery that we have and the brewing installation that we use to make our beer and our process. But as we're doing that, um, dovetail uh, some interactive aspects to into it and um, pair uh, four beers um, that are made with the exact same grains. So it was very uh, helpful and happy and lucky that um, when I asked uh, my friend Dumble Muffet at AP Bakery um, to bake these off for me yesterday morning and amongst their, all the other things that they're doing. Um, Florence and I were at the bakery at 4.20 yesterday morning picking up these loaves. And what we've done is we have four um, loaves that are the exact uh, same other than one aspect, which is um, a uh, whole um, wheat stone ground flour. Uh, sorry, wheat. Um, flow, please stop. Um, and uh, the beers themselves are the same other than the last one. These three are the exact same other than using that exact same grain from the exact same farm from the exact same year um, as well. So these are literally uh, parallels to each other. Um, our gold beer, which you're tasting right now, is 60% uh, malted um, pale barley. Um, hey, Flo. Flo, hey, girls. <laughs> girls, Flo. Hey, girls. Girls, if you need to go outside and do some drawing, you can, but otherwise you can stay here, okay? Thank you. Um, our, our gold beer, which we're tasting first, is 60% uh, malted schooner barley um, from uh, the Greenwood farm, the Greenwood family in Collyambly, uh, New South Wales, so the um, Riverina area. Um, it's a uh, certified organic farm, and we would certainly call, I would certainly identify what they're doing as regenerative. Um, the 60% uh, pale um, malted barley and 40% raw red Beaufort wheat. And that's what we're um, tasting in the bread as well. The bread is 70%, um, uh, uh, it's like 60 or 70%, just a, a, a roller mill white wheat to kind of carry, and then 40% of the um, freshly milled uh, raw Beaufort, Beaufort wheat. Um, we use the raw red wheat in this one. Um, because it, when it mills, or when we mill it, and when we smell it in the in the um, in the mash, it has this beautiful white chocolate kind of uh, aroma to it. It's really creamy, um, and this beer doesn't have, really have anything to stand on other than its fermentation characteristics and the flavors from the grain. And I, while it's an acidic beer, and while it has a fair bit of tartness to it, I do want that tartness to be kind of lemon meringue, creamy like. And so we like this 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 red uh, red meat for that. The other beers, just to go through them quickly, and then I can kind of jump back in in between um, beer and process. Um, the field, these two um, are made with a uh, hard wheat, so the Spitfire and the soft wheat Rosella um, from Ian and Courtney's farm um, at Woodstock or the family farm. Um, so we're getting a hard wheat, which I think you can definitely see here a little bit, 
and then back to another soft wheat, which is here. And then um, we had a malted loaf um, that we were doing uh, for this, but um, Dougal, uh, <laughs> when he came in um, on Sunday morning, um, the malt had done its work, and it was just, just kind of, uh, the loaves had completely fallen apart, even though he only had a tiny, tiny bit in the, um, in the actual mix, we sort of tried to, to, um, to uh, like put it in a basket with, with um, I'm too technical, but have the malt on the outside of the crust. So we didn't send that, but instead, um, the, the beer and the bread on this one will be a little bit different in that this is with um, uh, wheat from uh, a breeder with the legendary tea guys. Thanks for your help. Uh, a regenerative grower called Bruce Maynard. Um, so a bit of a legend uh, there, and this is the first time we've made bread with it. Um, Dougal made four loaves and I took three of them from him, so we have, those are very special breads. Anyway, um, again, being part of this interactive aspect, A, did everyone get some bread? Does anyone need some? We'll pass them around. Great. Yes, yeah, pass, pass, pass that around. Um, yeah, and again, do apologize for this big talk yesterday in the morning. I went straight to the airport, put it in my bag, and I could smell the bag coming off the carousel at <laughs> the airport because it was like emanating heat and, and aroma. Um, so, you know, not the freshest, but I also do think that potentially some of the um, the flavors coming about um, a little bit more. Um, and then beer, did everyone get a little bit? This is the third bottle of beer, so we're empty. Need some here? Great, no worries, we'll do that. Okay, so, oh, okay. Um, well, now it's okay. You really don't So, a little bit about, oh, did, uh, also, interactive. What do we think? I mean, they're quite different for us, and that the goal is about uh, 18 months in barrel, on average, before um, this one was bottled uh, in June 2022, um, so a decent amount of time in bottle. Um, but um, the, anyway, does anyone see any parallels? Might be more interesting if we keep going. We're gonna keep, what I'll do is I'll keep a bottle of beer and we'll keep extra slices of each bread up here so that maybe after we can have some Q&A and just come and taste and do some side-by-sides as we do it. A um, little bit about us. So Wildflower was started in 2016 uh, between me, uh, myself, and my brother-in-law, uh, Chris. Uh, I've spent um, a fair bit of time in the brewing industry, or a little bit of time in the brewing industry. I studied um, astrophysics, so nothing to do with this whatsoever, but I realized that doing beer and uh, beer people particularly, not uh, very much, not excluding studio, are a lot more fun to be around than um, physicists. Uh, and I don't have a problem with physicists, but the conferences are a lot fun, more fun, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so I uh, spent some time um, in Europe, living in northern Spain, and when I was there, uh, kind of decided that, that uh, I didn't want to go back and do my PhD and instead. So decided, why don't we, why don't we have a crack at this? Um, and what the, the uh, original idea for the brewery, which we still sort of care about, was to um, started as a sense. Uh, the brewery started as a bit of a rejection to things that were happening in the, in the beer world at the time, and, and arguably they're still happening. Um, so uh, that I wanted to see to be different, and so I could either leave the industry and, and say that's not for me. Um, but instead, we went the route of saying, well, let's just start the space that we think it can be. Um, so beer is very much marketed to, uh, made for in the past 30 years a single uh, gender, and that was one thing that particularly uh, myself and my wife felt um, wasn't uh, fitting for, for our life. And um, we wanted to create a brewery whose, whose uh, flavor profiles, uh, aesthetic, I mean, the space itself, the way that we talk about beer um, just, didn't, just didn't carry uh, the masculinity that in, in a lot of times it does. One of the things that sort of really surprised me and ignorantly was as we were traveling through Belgium and France, um, the flavor profiles that uh, particularly my wife was more drawn to were those that shared fermentation characteristics with other aspects of, um, uh, with, with, with other fermented products. Acidity of a white wine, um, some of the funkiness that you get in sake, and also some of the acid compounds in, in cider are shared with these styles of beer that use native yeast. Um, to ferment them rather than um, monoculture um, lab propagated yeast. And so me and my sort of ignorant dumb male mind was sort of, sort of shocked because these styles of beer were like lauded, you know, as like the pinnacle of beer fermentation at the time and all the breweries that were making them were like really cool Instagram breweries 
and they had like queues going out the door, and it was what all the beer nerds wanted. Um, and uh, when I was there, and I think through the process of speaking to my wife, we sort of came about, we came, we left with the idea that um, these beers, uh, at least this style of beer, this um, natural fermentation, let's call it, um, wasn't something that uh, was just for the a prize for Vanguard. This is a very uh, plebeian product. Um, and in fact, these styles of beer have been made on farm, or at least in some sort of processing um, facility, generally by women, um, for the majority of what we would now know as, as, as uh, a grain of, of barley fermented products that we call beer. Um, so when we came back to Australia, we decided to stick with that as our kind of founding principle, is that using native uh, yeast, for, yeast and bacteria, forage of native flowers, to ferment our beer. Um, the other thing that was happening a lot in the beer world that we were, just, that we were going against um, to start our brewery was this um, aggression in style, you know, high ABV, high hop profile, high malt profile, um, lots of adjuncts, which still happens today, like adjuncts being additives to the beer. Um, and for me, this, this idea that complexity was built, you know, by adding more things to your beer, you get a more complex beer, didn't sit well with, with how uh, Bernadette, my partner and I, um, saw complexity. Instead, we just wanted the brewery to, to make beers that were complex by their nuance. So it's by removing those large, um, kind of highlighted characteristics um, that, that we really get something that I think is of, of value in. So um, we started the brewery, and uh, we had um, a, when you when you ferment beer with um, native yeast, you get the whole the whole gamut. Um, you don't just get monoculture Saccharomyces fermentation. So we had to accept that our beers were going to become sour, they were going to become funky, and then um, and then we were going to need to have a, a room full of barrels um, and blend them to get the flavors that we're after. So that was a sort of small little story. I'll move on to the grain in a second. Are there any questions at this stage about um, either the beers? So I think we might move on to the Spitfire um, next. Yeah. You say um, you talk about the white flowers and white yeast. Yes. What, what sort of flowers? What sort of flowers? Generally, wattle. Wattle is probably the best ferment fermenter for us. I think wattle is an opportunistic bloomer, um, and on the parts of Australia that we are, we generally see it blooming on the shoulders of winter, um, and uh, but it can it can at any stage. We just saw some today that we're walking in, but. Um, uh, I think water was really great because my inherent thought is that it was it was really great because it is slightly on the colder months either side. So some of the more nefarious bacteria that is can be associated with beer fermentation are less um, present at that time. Now that is completely anecdotal. Um, at the same time, I've I've done a spontaneous fermentation in the middle of summer, and by spontaneous I mean I leave out wort overnight, wort being unfermented beer. Um, and just let the nighttime air, whatever falls into the, the, the vat that it's sitting in that night, that would be the inoculant for that fermentation. And I have conducted it in summer. The big copper thing. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we do. We do that in the winter time with, with, in, in, in your neck of the woods. Um, but we've also done it in summer with successful results. So I think water for us, um, I'm also quite drawn to the color yellow. I get this really beautiful, I love the story of water. I love what it is. Um, also, uh, credit where credit's due, um, I was at a talk with Max Allen and he just completely schooled me that using uh, native flowers to ferment uh, non highly alcoholic beverages was nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. And there are um, uh, documentation of language groups in Western Australia that had done that ceremony with Grevalia for long, you know, however, however long. So, um, wow. um, so yes, the, uh, the flowers. Yes. Briefly. Yeah. Certainly, the latter. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of what I'm just about to move on to talk about with with, with my in, with in grain influence comes from influence from bread. Um, I'm not a baker. I've never worked as a commercial baker, but I baked a lot at home. Um, because when we lived in northern Spain, uh, the bread there was awful, um, so you had to have something um, else. So um, I, uh, I um, you know, did, did home baking for a, a lot of time, and this idea of having a culture that keeps going, that we can peel from and do a fermentation, and then go back to that culture and keep going building from that, is sort of how we, build, we built our 
house culture um, of a mixture of yeast and bacteria and other organisms um, from flowers. So how we do that physically is literally go to um, the wild um, or what we think of as wild in, in bushy areas. Generally try to be not in the flight path of America, which is where we are located. <laughs> um, and uh, take uh, flowers at, at blossom. So when they are, when they have nectar. Um, and basically when, when bees or birds are going at them, because anywhere in the wild that there's sugar, you also find yeast. Um, so we are kind of going intentionally trying to find Saccharomyces, but you just get everything else when you go for that. And what we'll do is I'll cut those um, blossoms down, definitely not on national parks or state parks, so you can't do that. Um, and uh, put them into a sort of a sanitized Rolemire class, the five liter one is usually where I got to start. And then we cover that with, with sterile work. So uh, unfermented beer, so just a, a sweet barley uh, liquid um, that uh, you can bitter with hops if you choose, or, or, or other herbs. Um, and those, that bittering aspect can pre-select and kind of select out um, some organisms. So by bittering it, you can slow down the growth of lactic acid bacteria. So if you want a more sour culture, because of the microbial Exactly, and it's what they're there for, um, you know, traditionally, uh, is to slow that down. Um, but you can also use uh, rosemary, um, gentian, lots of things to, to, to suppress certain colonies, if you so choose. So none of, the, none of the cultures that we use in our beer have ever been run through a lab, and we've never you know, given it to a lab and had them rebuild something back up. If the, beer, if the culture's getting too sour, we brew a more bitter beer and collect from that. If it's getting, if it's getting too funky, we'll adjust in a different way by brewing more successively um, time and time again. Um, Ian's not here, is he? Ian Love. Great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I love Ian. But um, he, he, like, we, we've talked a lot about this, that potentially if we brew with our culture every single day and even starting that ferment every single day, the same characters would probably show up, but probably just in different times. So you're always going to get bright characters, pretend lactic characters and lactic acid bacteria. So we just did these small starter ship cultures, and then um, would continually and successively build them up, um, uh, and just to make bigger and bigger batches. Yeah. Let's go on to the Spitfire, and I'll talk a little bit about grain and, and how we work with it. Girls, um, could y'all grab Flo, uh, Clem? Could y'all grab some of this? Um, and we might need some more, might need some more Spitfire, yeah, going. Um, so to do these beers, um, <coughs> called them um, field work. Um, to do these two, it took. Yes, please pass them around. Thank you. Um, thank you. So gold is our main beer, um, and that's probably about sixty to seventy percent of what we make. Uh, it goes into a lot of, it gets broken into a lot of different other beers. Um, but we have been interested in um, going back to sea banks, of course, and you know, developer looking at um, heritage varietals of wheat that work really well in our beer. Because the, because the wheat is unmalted and because we use it uh, in such a high proportion relative to other brewers, it does have a pretty big impact on, on the flavor of the, of the beer. And so um, with stew and then, and then the, the, the farm that we get a lot of barley, I'm always sort of interested. Um, you know, Stu can probably back this up. Like if you ask the brewer um, what varietal of barley they have, I would say in Australia, mm, I reckon 2%, maybe one, might know the answer to that question. The, yeah, this year. Hi. Um, might know the actual varietal of barley um, that's actually being used. And so uh, we, I certainly didn't know it when I started, but this, this uh, um, uh, journey, I suppose, that I've been on by looking at grain and being a little bit more serious about it has led us to start thinking about single varietals of wheat and barley and saying, okay, we work ourselves in a box. We've set ourselves a box at the brewery of saying we work with entirely New South Welsh um, uh, grains. Um, we work with a hot pork matric up in New Zealand because Hot Rocks Australia is owned by a multinational and they don't give a fuck about a lot of things, so we're just moving away from that. Um, and uh, uh, so instead of saying, and this is the main beer that we make, so we basically have ourselves boxed in in terms of the quality of the product that we have. Like we have this line, this, you know, like these are our um, non negotiable. Uh, um, uh, 
aspects to the, to the brewery, I suppose. Um, so how do we make our beer better? It's not only from um, the farming methods, and that's where we got started with in 2018 or 19, I think, together, um, but also the varieties. So to do these beers, though, these beers were brewed um, uh, over two, two years ago and only just released um, quite recently because in order to see the full development of these strains, at least in our beer, um, it takes a huge amount of time. So I'm quite envious often of bakers and brewers of faster turnaround beers because you can test things a lot faster. Um, so to do to do these beers, I'm not trying to say this is like super special, but it kind of is because it took me two years just, just to be able to do this stuff that I didn't know I was going to be able to be doing. But um, Spitfire, no, I don't have a bottle opener, sorry. Uh, here, I can do it. Yeah, they're, they're a bit, um, they're a bit, oh. there we go. Um, yeah, it's right. Yeah, it's Depends on which part of the industry you're going for. Um, let's say like craft beers um, um, uh, would be yeah, somewhere in the 90s, 90s or, or 100% malted. Uh, macro beer would be a little bit lower because you'd be using something like rice or corn. Uh, not, not so much in Australia, but in other parts of the world um, to, to cut with that to get cheaper sugar sources um, with that. And uh, we're using 40% raw wheat. And the reason we can do that is because of um, the fermentation profile, allowing more starch to be in the wort um, gives our wild yeast something to chew on uh, later on in the fermentation when the Saccharomyces has cleaned up all of the, the, the cheap and easy um, sugars. Uh, yeah. No worries, yes. 40%. Yeah, I'll, I'm. I'm like I said 30 and then I remember doing the text in the book, so um, it's, it doesn't look like it so much at the moment, um, but anyway, it still smells good. Um, so that was the Spitfire. So the Spitfire, um, the beer itself for me is much more steely. It's more austere. We were using, we were using Spitfire a lot um, when we started from John, um, from North Star and, and uh, more than New South Wales. And that, that harder wheat was A, really hard for us to mill in our little roller mill. Um, and, uh, but also we found that you know, with the flavor profile we were going after, which is a bit fleshier, this is a very lot of all beer, you know, it's, it's 4.85%. Um, there's really like, nothing to hide behind. When we had that more steely, um, kind of austere uh, line, the acid showed a little bit more. I think, I mean, looking at some faces around, I think you can see that. Um, so it's interesting to see because I think that the, the hard wheat does give us something um, saline, uh, which I really like, like a tidal pool um, kind of seashell, uh, oyster shell um, character, um, but it, there's, a, there's a trade off, you know, um, we, we don't get some of the warmth. Um, so uh, while it's a lovely uh, wheat, um, you know, I'm very sorry to say that I won't be buying it. So uh, in to, so I mentioned these these sort of um, these sort of boxes that we put ourselves in. Of, like we say, this is our mantra, and this is how we're going to do things. Um, I'm I'm quite uh, stubborn. Um, you just ask my wife. Um, so when I've said that this is this is how we do things, we only use this culture of use. We only use New South Wales trains, um, and uh, the step that we put, the step that we are taking as a as a brewery. There's there's John. We used to spit fire for the first few years of brewery. Um, um, the step that we decided to take, uh, which was called largely influenced by the wine movement, which is some, something I was thinking about just today about the sort of confluence of um, you know the, the regenerative agriculture movement in grain, a little bit in beer as it's coming along, and also um, it sort of ties into wine. So James Erskine from Yama Farm um, in the Adelaide Hills was speaking to me about you know why isn't your grain organic, and I have you know that kind of. Um, the, the common uh, response about, oh, you know, it's too hard, or you know, the organics comes with all this other things in it, and it wasn't, um, wasn't pure grain, or I don't even know what I said at the time, but he said it in a lovely way that really challenged me to say, what, what, why is it organic? And at the time, if you went and looked at a product list from any um, Australian malt supplier, which at that time just would have been Stu, 
um, at Voyager, and I keep wanting to see Sue, I'm glad you're here, because otherwise it would be really awkward, I'd be like, this Sue guy. Um, Sue, or there are two, um, I can say this, supermarket suppliers of grains, is that fair, is that pretty rude? The big time bag. We sort of work in a duopoly system in the brewery as well. So there's two um, supermarket suppliers of grain. Um, that that's what well, I mean. We have we have Joe White and Bear Version, the two big monsters, and each of those has supply contracts through two um, uh, distributors and, and uh, grains and brewing supply um, groups in Australia. So if you looked at any of their price lists, um, which is so, if you go to open a brewery, um, you would set up a, a contract with Bintani, and I don't buy from either of them, so I'm going to know um, more. All right, thank you. Um, you got set up with with you. So you looked at either of their um, prices, and you went, okay, I want an organic malt, go, 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 go. You move through the Australia section, there's nothing there. New Zealand section, nothing there. Um, you'd have to buy German malt um, at the time, 2019, to get anything that has a, a, a organic certification on it. Um, John was working at malt at the time, um, and Stu was getting started, and that was the two of them started what we now know as some sort of problem, malt with problem, which is great to love here. So thank you, it's really cool. And that that is moving through the brewing industry now, but still nothing with certification. And so um, while certification isn't the end all be all for me, it was something that we wanted to uh, challenge the industry with. And so um, with Stu's help, we found a grower um, in the Greenwood family in Collingwood, and we planted in. We sowed in March of 19, um, probably 200 hectare, 100, um, something. Small enough that it didn't make a blip, uh, but big enough that we were able to use it next year. Um, 19 was a shocking year, um, so really slow, really, really small yields, um, but incredibly proud that by the start of 2020, um, there was uh, an Australian grown, um, and Australian malted, uh, certified organic barley, uh, malted barley on the market for for home brewers, actually for, for, for commercial brewers as well. Um, and that project has slowly grown over time, um, but we're still on this sort of mission to be talking to brewers and particularly talking to consumers and saying this is a this is an option for your customers now. The idea that it's organic or the idea that it's regenerative is nice and makes us like feel nice on the, the inside about um, what we're doing for the soil and maybe for the environment or which certifier we're paying thousands of dollars to every year to get us to stay up on our bags. Um, but the reason that it's actually really important in beer and I was arguing for, for bread as well is that when we, when we obviously when we live in the map talk about soil, this is all the things that we're um, completely uh, in, into as well, but the uh, the brewing industry is like rife with with green elements and with green washing, and the breweries becoming carbon neutral or, or um, uh, whatever they're talking about, lowering their commercial impact by using the, the paper bio pack cups instead of the plastic ones, or they're moving to cans because they're more ecological choice other than glass or whatever. There's lots of claims being made, but when you look at the pie wheel of beer. Um, and where the majority of the carbon, carbon footprint comes from it is it's two places. About 60% of it together comes from two places, and depending on how you package things, um, it shifts a little bit, but one of them is the farming of the barley, and the second one is, is your packaging choices. So glass, your, the, the bottle is about 35 to 40%, uh, so 30 to 40% of the carbon footprint of beer, bottle or can, uh, and the, the barley, um, or the, the, the carbon, in, in bread, uh, in like, the carbon cost that the brewery brings on by buying the grain into it is also 30 to 40 percent from what we get from. So if we're looking at this pie chart of about a carbon footprint of a product, which you know every time that you you fly, you mention this again. I don't know if y'all seen it, but on like Google's flight um, thing, uh, like when you search for flights in Google, it'll show you how many tons of CO2 mm -hmm. um, that route is versus that route. So you can take lower carbon cost routes or something like that. But I feel like we're getting to a point, or we're maybe moving towards a point where people's carbon footprint can be tracked to, to a point where maybe we would have something like a, like a carbon wallet the way that I think about it. You know, there's no um, denying that I took a flight here um, to be here. Um, we can't really go about our business um, by just rejecting uh, everything out of hand. And I feel like it's a bit like money. We spend it in some ways and you save it in others. And as a, and as a brewer, um, think about the carbon footprint 
inbred in our into baked into our beer. And by using um, regenerative malt or particular organic, good organic malt, malt that isn't grown with system, um, systemic fertilizers, um, it reduces our carbon footprint dramatically. Um, up to the stage with the way that stew malts with a um, I don't know if you went through it, but with the biochar retorts, so using using heat from from walnut shells, that's a carbon um, zero process. And the farm um, has the, the Greenwoods farm has been um, has been tested to uh, sequester more carbon in the farming of their grains than they emit in the farming of the grains. And it's only got to go 30k up the road to stew, and then it's got to come inland to me. So depending on the carbon footprint of those transport options, we're getting a barley and wheat um, that is almost negligible in terms of the carbon footprint. Whereas it's in, you know, for a conventional um, brewer, it would be uh, about 30 or 40% of their, of their, of their um, total uh, beer. So um, it's been a long, long journey, and I think, I mean, Stu can speak to this more, and I need you to get up, but um, we are sort of slowly pushing people in one direction, slowly asking brewers to consider the grains that are in their beer, not only the farm, um, but also um, the varietals and who they're getting them from. Um, and I'll move on, I'll get on to that in, in a second. Um, we can move on to the rosella. Um, I might need someone, oh, Michael's gone, um, to chop up a bunch of things. Yeah, can you, can you help pass things around? Go around, thanks, thanks, love. Um, I can take some questions while we're doing this. Actually, yeah, there's any movement in Australia to grow more hops and, you know, move away from this like, uh, corporation? Yeah, sort of small. Monopoly, or? Hops, are, hops are pretty tough. So hops require a huge amount of processing directly at a harvest. Mm -hmm. um, so getting them down, stripping them, drying them, packaging <coughs> them. Yeah. So uh, we are a bit tied into and those processing plants. Um, it's, there's one, there's two in Victoria, um, and the, of this size of scale, and there's one in, in Tasmania. The two in the two in Victoria, um, one comes from um, one is at HPA in Ross Trevor, so just outside of Bright, uh, massive facility. The majority of hops in Australia are grown right there. Um, in this, hops are a perennial product, so are a perennial um, uh, plant. So it's, it's not quite as bad as grain growing in terms of the monoculture because we're not going through it with time. But I mean, if you went to the hot farm, it is just like monoculture. Same thing with that now. Yes, yeah. Um, the other one is um, Ellerslie. So that's a, that is a family operated farm. Um, uh, in, in, what's that? Wangarella. Where? Oh, it's Wangarella. Wangarella. Yeah, I've never actually been. So. Yeah, Wangarella. So similar area to, to HBO. Okay, cool. All right, so close by, and then there's one um, down in, in Bush Park. There is a small hot farm in the south, the south coast, there's a girl's called Ryefield that's been that's working on it. They're also highly nitrogen, um, like needy product, and to grow them um, to get like good uh, uh, yield, um, they, that farm has even found that they they have been um, adding um, synthetic nitrogen to their their dose and not not that. So that was the one thing that I missed. The major reason for um, the carbon footprint of uh, grain, conventional grain versus regen or organic grain, is um, urea, synthetic nitrogen. Um, in making uh, synthetic nitrogen, um, we emit uh, huge, huge, huge amounts of nitrous oxide, um, which is about uh, 700 times as opposed to greenhouse gas than CO2 is. So one ton of uh, nitrous oxide, this isn't nitrogen in two, um, uh, is usually hugely, hugely damaging um, to, the, to the environment. And also when you spread that urea, um, if the soil is wet too wet, if the soil is too dry, um, if there are a number of factors, depending on the wind, a huge amount of nitrous oxide is also um, uh, released directly into the atmosphere at the time. So that was the, that's the, the big difference. So hops is a bit of a longer game, but hops are make up less than one percent of the of the um, the carbon footprint of beer. So for us, and I'm not I'm not this like I, I also need to I need to back up because I think when we're talking about I can get a bit too into the to the to the carbon cost of things. It's, it's something that I think consumers can, they're starting to slightly understand, but the concept and, and purpose of regenerative agriculture is so much broader than just carbon footprint. 
Um, so I don't know if it's the best thing to be focusing on, but I only mention it because it catches people's ear. And they understand, wow, a brewer, you know, going into an brewery and say, you can cut your carbon, carbon footprint by 40% overnight by just buying a different malt. That comes at a 30% premium, 40? Um, how much more? <laughs> not, not that much. Like it, it's not, it's not double the cost um, by, by any means. Okay, next up is Rosella. Uh, so back to the soft wheat. Um, this is what I always get my cookies with at home. Love this, love this wheat very much. Um, so, uh, yeah. oh, it's, it's so good. Um, and when you sift it, the germ from it is like amazing for uh, all my cereals uh, in the morning. And then so back to the soft wheat. So um, these guys talk about this wheat giving a uh, much more honey character to um, breads and, and, and well, you don't need too much of breads, but just blue pastry, like more of this sweetness to it. And I do see that um, as well in the beer. So another soft wheat, so much more like that first one that we tried. Um, and uh, I actually haven't tasted the bread yet, so I'm going to take a look. Did everyone get some bread? Yeah? Okay. Everyone got some beer? Cool. Um, Um, so I gotta taste it now. Um, it's certainly in the grain spot, it's got a bit more formal character for me. Um, Putting on slide and yeah. I'm tasting it as before. What do you use now? <laughs> um, yeah, a bit more aromatic. Um, it, it did tend to have a lot more fruit in the fermentation, um, but so much so that it actually kind of almost threw our pro flavor profile out a little bit. So we have been talking about um, cutting the red wheat with the rosella. Um, the, the red meat's still giving us some, some really nice creamy characters, and we don't want to give up on that. Um, and we do get a lot of fruit character from fermentation alone and as well, but the, the rosella really backs that up. But it, they actually tasted quite sweet um, to our palate. I mean, this is almost completely bone dry. Like, there's almost no sugar left in it whatsoever. Um, but um, it's not showing some of the minerality right, that we get in the Spitfire and in the other bit, a little bit from here, from, from my perspective. Yeah. yeah, actually, kind of a little bit brighter in a good way for me, but also kind of a little bit creamier. I'm not sure okay. if it's the part of the bottle I've got. So it's no. nice. Well, this is why we don't do um, like uh, group panels um, for <laughs> no, I'm kidding. We probably should do like a product testing panel. Um, but no, no, I, 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 I tend to agree in terms of where we're at as well. Um, these should have been, these were all bottled um, within, um, within a month of each other, all of these. So we're looking at June and July of, of, of last year. So I'm conscious I've only got about 10 minutes left uh, and we still have to taste this last one. Um, so I'll, I'll jump straight into this last one because it kind of displays a couple of things. Again, um, we're going to move into an amber, which is a really a celebration of malt, uh, particularly Stu's um, Stu's um, Please don't do that. Um, which is really a celebration of the way that Stu's malt things. So we have a lot of um, Vienna malt and a lot of Vienna malt. But, but, but. Um, a lot of Vienna and, and um, Malta Munich. Uh, so Malta Vienna and Malta Munich. So if any bakers are interested in using um, uh, malt in their products, we sell um, on sale at cost uh, to um, Iggy's, AP, Goodwood, uh, Flower and Stone, um, who else? So a lot of bakeries in Sydney will just come to us and buy the Vienna malt, which is, which is heavy in this year. And you know, being used at one or two percent, um, in a grand, I think, I think it's about 100% of the people are using malt right up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, well, the, the Vienna is the one that bakers are tending to go to. The Munich, which is quite heavy in this one, can be a little too rich. Um, uh, but uh, the Vienna is really great. So anyway, plug for two. Um, the Amber is a 6% ABV beer. Um, a lot more malt itself, less raw wheat, only about 6% um, raw wheat. 
Um, and uh, the, the balance in this beer is between sweet and sour, right? We're trying to give the richness of the malt, um, a bit of the texture of the oak, um, and then the uh, acidity to clean that out. So it's a, it's a dark beer that has a kind of apparent heaviness with still a lot of freshness. Now, the bread has nothing to do with it, but let's just taste this on my side. Thank you. Wow. This is a, this is a soft wheat um, grown by um, a man called Bruce Maynard in, in Naramai, um, uh, in like northern New South Wales. If anyone has read um, Charles Massey's uh, like legendary book um, called The Reed Warbler, um, Bruce is heavily um, spoken about in the, in um, the book and has a number of chapters and helped write the book as well. Bruce um, is also the city um, Bob Box Bank here, um, Bank Air Australia recipient. So for the next two years, he's sort of he's just been been recognised as of last year as sort of one of these um, innovative farmers. He developed a product, uh, a, um, a process called no 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 kill cropping. Um, he's, a, he's he's more of his work is in um, stockmanship, so self herding, um, low stress stockmanship. Um, he's developed a number of, uh, of um, systems that work on farms um, in sort of central Australia and and around the world. So he's sort of known. Um, around the world, but sometimes around um, Australian cultures. He's a, he's a, Dougal's dad, so Dougal from AP who made this, um, his father uh, was also a grain grower, and for many years called Bruce Maynard the king of the cooks, um, like the cookie people. Um, <laughs> but, but now they've fully changed, and, and um, Jira Jira is fully on board. But um, uh, Bruce is growing this wheat um, in a grassland. So this, the, the, the soil um, and the paddocks that these that this wheat was grown on has never been tilled. Um, it was allowed, sorry, since for the last 30 years. Um, he has allowed it to go fully back into a grassland. It's full of perennials and um, that of, of native native perennials and also you know things like oat or like just wild oats that continually come up. And every single year when he goes to crop this, he generally, generally does oats for his for his lambs. Every year when he goes um, crop it, he can use the disc, disc seeder, which like gently cuts the earth, slides in the seed and folds it back down. And then he just allows his header to do the work at harvest. He's got this paddock that looks like absolute shit. There's just stuff everywhere. Header comes through and um, spits out a bunch of chaff and whatnot out the back and a bunch of seeds for, for, for next year. And then the work comes in and it later. And so he has two products. One is the grassland grain, which is what we're eating now. But this is the first time it's been milled. Like genuinely, this is the, the first loaf, the batches of bread that Bruce Maynard's things. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you can have that. Good job. Um, uh, Bruce Maynard's wheat has been milled into flour and baked into bread this, this yesterday morning, which is just for Bruce is 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 quite a big deal, and I'm sort of excited about eating it. But um, uh, when he gets two products out of it, is the grassland grain that he calls it, and also this product that he calls potpourri. Which is everything else, and when you look at this puffery, it's a it's a diversity of about 150 different seeds of all kinds of different things, native grasses as well as things that not just been kitchen cropping out there, little flowers and all kinds of things um, that come out of the cleaner. I mean, I can imagine it's an absolute piece of work for them to, to get seven clean seed out of it. Um, but we're going to be start, we're starting to brew with this puffery as well. Everything else kind of aspect, and it's one of the fun parts about brewing that I think a lot of um, if you do know growers, or you're working with growers, uh, or if you have brewers in your area, brewers are able to take a lot of extra stuff into the mash than you can, you know, having a clean wheat getting getting milled into a flour. The mash naturally separates husk material, straw material, other grains, um, and we filter that out, and then we and then we boil that part. So as brewers, we have a lot of play. Um, in terms of what we can take, and so if there is a grower, I think it's just sort of parting shot before you get questions and then come up. Um, if you are a brewer, like consider the fact that um, you have a huge opportunity to be able to work with the entire diversity of a paddock, um, which is really, really cool um, from my perspective. I've asked Stuart, I've asked him uh, a couple of years ago if we, could, if we could plant out a diverse paddock, you know, kind of companion planting. Um, in a paddock and then malt that all together and then brew with it. The reality is we would probably separate 
the, and then malt them separately to get good malt out of each of them and then recombine, but it's certainly certainly possible to do. Um, but what Bruce is doing is kind of just taking that onto the next level. Instead of even planting that diversity, he's just allowing that diversity to naturally be in the system. Um, so uh, it's, 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 anyway, I think it's quite exciting. Um, so I think at that stage, I'll, I'll finish up. It's 20, 20 past? Yeah, oh, it's 27 past. I'll finish up. Um, I'll take some questions. We'll leave um, things here. But um, thank you for letting me yarn for a little bit. Thank you for being part of my less than technical um, conversation and being palates uh, to, to, to taste um, these things. And thank you to the grain uncle for having me. Thank you. Thank you. So we are also quite lucky in beer to have labels, <laughs> and they're not just bags. So the labels um, now contain um, the label show um, farm, like farm specific ingredients, um, and that's taken us a long time to work through what we're actually using. So that's one aspect. Um, when we're using when we're using single varietals, we'll obviously go quite a bit more text. So that's one aspect. Um, I'm I'm like uh, sort of. Someone who is someone's been helping us redo our website, and we were on a, 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 a video call with that, and um, she said to me, she said, you know, the website's great, but there's just like too much content, <laughs> and, and I felt like that was like a like a microcosm for my entire life, and just, like, too much content for everyone. So I tend to just overtell the story, I think, and maybe not use uh, succinct, where you know it takes a lot longer to write a small speech, just a short speech, than it does to write a longer one or a book or, or essay as, as it were. So I tend to just try and tell that story through through what we do. Um, I mean, as, as sort of uh, nefarious as the tool can be and the company is, um, Instagram's been really, really helpful for us to be able to just just kind of um, flesh out and just tell people um, what uh, we're doing. People can only be interested in what you tell them about. Um, so I'm not suggesting that you need to put every single meal you ever eat up there on the internet, but when I'm excited about something, I can't help but just to put it out there. And if no one cares about it, that's totally fine. Um, but the amount of potters that I follow that put like intense process about how they do their their, their ceramics, that I'm never gonna do that. I mean, like I do ceramics, but I'm not nearly as good as some of these people, but I'm still interested in it. And I always think about that from how we're doing it is like, Sure, no, I'm, not, I'm not trying to keep any secrets because I'm not going to assume that anyone's just going to tomorrow try to, you know, annual label to do. If they do, fucking great. Like, I don't, that's, a, that's fantastic. Um, but you don't have to, I, I feel like we just keep putting out what we're doing at our level. And if people understand it, fantastic. But they don't have to, to still get around it and be like, they support that. I, I think I mentioned a little bit before, like, there's a lot of people that want to do the right thing. You know, they've watched Kiss the Ground or whatever, the 2040, like the kind of, uh, of course, be careful, but like the um, the Byron Bay region group, you know, doing whatever they do. We're just looking at everyone what they should do. So they watch those videos, but then they don't really know how to do that in their daily life. And they've got shit on their plate, like everyone's pretty busy. So just putting that information out there, I think, and just not trying to calculate it, just like, hey, this is what we're up to, if you reckon it's cool, we'll do it. So that's, that's, that's my suggestion. Sorry, sorry, just to explain oh, yeah. before we go to your next question. Just want to um, mention to everyone that the mini buses, if you are catching a bus back to Ket, are leaving very shortly. Okay. So, we'll so still time for a yeah. question or two, but if you're on the bus, <laughs> better head off shortly. You've made a shower of the uh, from Esther a little while ago. Yeah. 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 Yeah.